our supposedly moral thoughts could be dr simply driven into us in some miraculous way. Unusual events normally are, he says, and should be taken to be occasions for nourishing reason and the theoretical, quote, hope of discovering new laws of nature. Kant dis uh, dismisses worries that we have, quote, no cognition, it's also an important quote, 688, we have no cognition of the cause of gravity, for we do, but we do have cognition of the laws of these forces sufficient for regressive employment in the ordering of experiences under them. And his final sentence in this footnote and to part two as a whole, Kant responds directly uh, to those who pretend to have no insight into how the very complex natural developments that come with every return of spring are a matter of the, quote, immediate influence of the creator. So he's attacking some uh, enthusiastic people at the time. Against this dramatic pretense, Kant dramatically proclaims, quote, but these, uh, the return of spring, these are experiences, erfahrungen. Therefore, for us, they're nothing but effects of nature and ought never to be judged otherwise. And he claims by, uh, closes by saying that in, uh, to accept this point is the true modesty of reason in contrast to the false humility, humility of invoking miracles. The appeal here to the notion of a fang is, of course, not a matter of crude representationalist empiricism, but a content reminder of the common sense factum underlying the entire critical system, which is a structured and cognitive domain, and one that turns out to be law governed in a very strict way without any reference to miraculous interventions. Now, the fact that Kant stresses the words for us and ought in that uh, quote is also an explicit uh, implicit reminder of another aspect of what he means by reason's modesty, namely that he's speaking only about what our maxims should be for making determinate claims. And again, he does not go so far as to make any absolute denials beyond these maxims. All the same, I think that really what he's saying, if I were to invent uh, a quote of my own, uh, I think he's saying something like, it's always possible to introduce miracles in nature, but a rational person should not do so, given where we in fact stand, with our well-structured domain of Ethong. And therefore, you look at quote two, uh, this is an interpretation. I think that their uh, Kant's tone indicates that uh, this can be read indirectly uh, as sarcasm, um, given uh, what we've seen so far. And so when he says, it might well be, it's my goal that uh, actually the text doesn't say Jesus, he says the teacher of the gospel, the teacher of the gospel is appearance on earth as well as his translation from it, his eventful life and his passion are all but miracles. Indeed, that the history that ought to testify to the account of these miracles is itself a miracle. I think that's sarcasm. The suggestion that once one starts on this path, one might as well introduce second order miracles implies that Kant has lost sympathy with affirming any particular miraculous works. But this again leaves uh, the critical question of how that would differ from his uh, holding on to non-natural effects of other non-natural sources and uh, uh, the works of freedom which others might regard as similar to miracles. Section three, critique of pure wonder. This has to do with the German term. Uh, this point uh, about miracles is not a matter of casual interest for Kant because he repeatedly stresses uh, a way of speaking that plays off the language of miracles, but gives it a critical twist. So uh, if you look at the first general, this is also quote one under section three there, a general remark that links Kant's central notion of what he calls a revolution in our way of thinking, as in the new creation of a person uh, in the faith of, in the Vernunftglaube, uh, he links that with the attitude of what he calls proper admiration, bewunderung, for virtuous actions. Uh, in the German edition, uh, and I think this is masked a bit in the uh, translation, but in the German it's impossible to miss the Kant's main point here. His aim is to substitute uh, and draw attention to a substitution for the reference to wunder, that's, that is literal miracles, a supposedly much more modest reference to bewunderung, which is just a sense of amazed admiration with regard to the moral law or examples of uh, radically giving one's life to morality. This key terminological point of the religion is anticipated uh, in Kant's slightly earlier theodicy essay, which uses the term bewunderung to describe uh, a very important thing, namely the proper reaction to the story of Job. Kant takes this story to teach us 
to respect the primacy of pure morality and sincerity as opposed to any pretense of being able to discern specific actions of God in the world as specially intended punishments. Although the essay is perhaps best known for its title reference to a miscarriage or failure of theodicies, Kant's basic point there is rather that although one cannot expect speculative or uh, theoretical philosophy to show how the world actually does serve God's purposes, this is consistent with accepting what he calls their authentic theodicy, uh, which takes proper service to God to, rely, to be basically a matter of accepting the primacy of the moral law. So the end, in the sense of the limitation or defeat of traditional theodicy, is thus for Kant only the beginning, and also it, it leads to the goal and the victory of what he takes to be the genuinely uh, theodistical attitude. So that's part of the reason for the title of the paper. That this kind of discussion of miracles is very important for Kant uh, became clear to me uh, looking again at Kant's uh, very last essay, uh, which he put a lot of work into, a very complicated essay, The Conflict of the Faculties. His discussion occurs in the first part of the text, where I think, again, the translation doesn't uh, do it justice in the English, uh, where, again, you'll see there's a sharp distinction between a mere bewunderung and literal wunder. Uh, and this you have quote, long quote two there, section three. The general remark in this part of the conflict is devoted to the advocacy of our moral metamorphosis in a pure religious revolution that would take us beyond all sectarianism. Kant goes out of his way there explicitly to reject recourse to miracles uh, by traditional pietists and Moravians, and then he turns immediately to what he calls the something in us that we cannot cease to admire, or, uh, or that one translation wonder at, Wunder, namely the moral law, and this is maybe the most important quote of all, that lies, he describes this as something that lies objectively in the natural order of things as the object of pure reason. Kant here speaks also of our Huxton bewundering with italics, and he repeatedly uses a verb form of the uh, term. For significant reasons that will be discussed later, Kant is here contrasting the appreciation of what he calls the supersensible practical law that is in us, that is, that is contained in our nature as beings of reason and moral reason, with the greatly mistaken move of those who, quote, are led to consider it supernatural, that is, you know, kind of weirdly miraculous, and as to regard it as the influence of another and higher spirit. The repeated use of the term revolution in the religion is clearly meant to resonate at a number of complex uh, theodistical levels at once. Uh, so there's a lot of history here, but that's the distinctive thing about Kant's discussion of the order of humanity more than some of the other philosophers we talked about. In addition to the revolution discussed first simply in terms of each individual person's conversion to pure morality, Kant claims that there is secondly a related general revolution within the human race, one that was inaugurated, although not completed, by the Gospels. Kant goes so far as to say a number of times that the innovative moral attitude of the teacher of the Gospels fundamentally excels anything found in prior philosophy, all the ancients, uh, and that the revolutionary ideal that defines it and is exemplified in stories of the teacher's life is nothing less than the major force behind the ultimate direction of all subsequent history. This ideal introduces, quote, a realm in which nobody is therefore slave, for by exemplifying that principle in the moral ideal, that human being, the teacher of the gospel, opened the doors of freedom to all. The main theme of the part two of the religion, and especially the subpart concerned with the personified good and objective reality of the ideal person in the gospels, is that a relation back to this very ideal as an ideal model, rather than an external miraculous fact, is what is crucial for each individual moral revolution in modern life. In addition, Kant links each such modern individual revolution forward to the new ideal of an autonomous social realm, one whose success he anticipates now because of the effects of a recent philosophical development. Kant understands this development to have been generated by the explicit appeal to the idea of autonomy uh, in uh, what he calls the genius of Rousseau's work, work that can be called a third kind of critical revolution. This work literally turned around the direction of Kant's own thought in the early 1760s, and so it is no accident that the very beginning of the religion, and many places later in the book, 
links the theme of, our, of, of a reborn optimism to Rousseau's awareness of what's called the seed, the chyme, or germ, of goodness in humanity as such. And according to the Collins lectures, Kant held that, quote, many have maintained that in man there are no seeds of good, only of evil, and Rousseau alone preaches the opposite. Rousseau's revolutionary philosophical achievement is to begin to turn cultivated modern humanity away at a level that is itself reflective and literary from the special problem of its absolutization of the life of luxury and scientific preoccupation, just as the Gospels began to turn naive ancient humanity away at a level that is itself religious and exemplary from the obsession with mere priestly trappings and superstition that Kant, for better or for worse, takes to define the pre-Christian world. The last two parts of the religion, along with other late essays related to it, fill out then Kant's revolutionary narrative by taking the what he calls the enthusiastic affirmative response of common people throughout Europe in their unselfish sympathy toward the basic anti-idealist, anti-elitist ideal of the French Revolution to be what he calls an irreversible sign of humanity's entrance into the political antechamber of history's final era, and thus to constitute what I would call a critical revolution in yet a fourth and most concrete sense. This sign bolsters Kant's own hope that individual moral revolutions will be combined more and more with Republican and peaceful political reformation, and that an enlightened and visible church will move humanity as a species asymptotically toward an earthly realization of the theodicy of the Vernunftglaube. And then within this last phase, finally, works such as Kant's own system and enlightenment essays, as well as similar works by allies such as Reinhold, can be understood as intended to be part of a fifth, a final critical uh, revolution, a late modern Copernican turn that aims at perpetually securing at a meta level the insights of Christianity's and Rousseau's moral visions, as well as those of common humanity and the fans of the French Revolution by saving them hopefully forever from all future contamination by dogmatic or naive misunderstandings. So Kant's use of the term bewunderung is hardly casual. It's clearly positioned in a place that's central to his complicated multi-stage theodistical account of how a pure moral religion is supposed to move through various interlocking uh, revolutions away from a prior miracle-oriented era uh, to the final phase of history. The puzzle remains, however, that at the same time that Kant works out this progressive enlightenment view of society and history, he continues to make what must still seem to be some extraordinarily immodest, non-natural remarks of his own about how all human beings really can work freely toward this highest good. And Kant confesses right from the start that each step in his complex epic of freedom rests on nonsensible factors that are entirely within us, but whose operation, quote three, uh, is absolutely inexplicable. Uh, to us. So, to sum up, in the hopeful attitude of Vernunftglaube, a Kantian must affirm that existence on the whole is a teleological unified complex of, first, a natural sphere that's fully law-governed, though not by itself moral or with any miraculous interventions. Second, a moral sphere that's also law-governed, but not by itself either sensible or literally miraculous. And yet as such that third, all the non-natural features just reviewed fit together so that the laws of morality also turn out to govern the general shape of the laws of the natural world and world history. So that's, you know, is that any weirder than a miracle? It's up to you to think of. Okay, so where does this come from? This is just a historical guess of how, you know, how deep this thought is in Kant. It's not a justification. Uh, Kant's theodicy thus implies uh, section four, not only a very strict conception of each of the cosmological and moral orders by themselves, but also a very strong commitment to their tight linkage. It is precisely these two orders, you know, that are referenced in the most famous of Kant's phrases, the second critique's comment about our ever-increasing bewunderung und Ehrfurcht with regard to the starry heavens above and the moral law within. What this uh, commit, comment should remind us of now is not so much the individual features of these two contrasting sources of our amazed admiration and awe, 
but rather the fact that this text connects them in one grand statement,